For years now, people have been asking me to address modern monetary theory on this channel. What is modern monetary theory? In short, it is the idea that governments can use deficit spending to help their economies reach full employment and to help people save money with very little downside. If you're an advocate of MMT watching this, hold your horses because I will get into the detail later on. Now, I have been reluctant to tackle this topic, not only because it is a load of old rubbish, but also because its advocates do not even speak the same sort of language that I do. Which is to say that, in my view, they are no longer doing economics as I would recognise it. I will explain why in due course, but first it is important to note why somebody like me would reject MMT as a non-starter before even looking at their policy proposals. There are two key reasons. First is its understanding of the origin of money, and second is its understanding of inflation. As you'll find in my old video called The Origins of Money, my view is that money emerged as a natural market phenomena to solve the problem of a barter system having to rely on the double coincidence of wants. Some commodity will emerge, be it shells, precious stones, precious metals like gold or silver, to act as a medium of exchange. And we can readily see this process at work in prisons when it has often been the case that cigarettes emerge as the medium of exchange. The advocates of modern monetary theory reject this explanation of the origins of money and follow a doctrine known as chartalism, which holds that actually all money derives from governments. In effect, all money is fiat money which arises out of the government's need to levy taxes. In this view, money is not a commodity but a function of law. And you see, here we are already at an impasse because I think that explanation of the origin of money is just plain wrong. And we can see it is wrong whenever we see exchange mediums emerge in a natural market, as in prisons or in black markets when states collapse, such as what happened in Somalia, for example, or in cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin. In 2008, for example, the in-game virtual currency of World of Warcraft was worth nearly seven times more than the Venezuelan Bolivar. And this brings me neatly to my second key area of disagreement before we even get to what MMT is, which is that its advocates have an erroneous view of what causes inflation. In the case of Venezuela there, Everyone knows that they experienced hyperinflation because their government resorted simply to printing loads of money off. Zimbabwe famously had a similar experience, as did the German Weimar Republic in the early 1920s. These are extreme examples, but the fact remains that inflation is always caused by an increase in the money supply. Inflation everywhere and always is a monetary phenomenon. And again, this is not just a function of governments or central banks issuing money. In the 1850s, for example, the California gold rush more than doubled the production of gold, which was at the base of the monetary system in the 19th century. The result was inflation, a near 30% increase in wholesale prices between 1850 and 1855. Incidentally, advocates of MMT like to point out that various rounds of quantitative easing since the 2008 crisis have not resulted in serious inflation. But as I explained in my recent video on government bonds, that is because most of the liquidity generated by QE never actually made it into the real economy, but rather sat on the asset balance sheets of financial firms, which is to say all of those bonds are sitting in the M3 money supply, which is quite different from what the MMTers want to do which is an increase of cash in the real economy that would enter into circulation through the wages of government employees, which is to say an increase in the M1 money supply. The effect of this would be undoubtedly inflationary for reasons I have already mentioned. But look at how advocates of MMT talk about inflation. This is from an article in Business Insider. 
It says, although the stereotype of MMT is about inflationary spending, the reality is that MMTers take inflation very seriously. At full employment, except for imports, the economy's resources are all used, according to L. Randall Ray. Any further spending will be inflationary. At full employment, the government is in direct competition with the private sector, he says. And if the private sector can match you, then you get into a bidding war and you can cause inflation and you will drive up prices. You can cause inflation and you will cause inflation if you reach full employment and you continue to try to increase spending. Now this is the long discredited theory of idle resources, a special from our old friend John Maynard Keynes, back in a new disguised form. This was demolished as far back as 1939 by W.H. Hutt. To save us some time, I will quote from Hunter Lewis's excellent introduction to that book to get to the meat of the problem. He says, Keynes's argument may be simplified as follows. Full employment should be our goal. The market system will not get us there. It requires government help as well as guidance. This means in practice that government will continually print money in order to reduce interest rates ultimately to zero and also borrow and spend as needed. Booms are good. Even economic bubbles are acceptable. Recession and bust must be avoided at all cost. As Keynes wrote, the right remedy for the trade cycle is not to be found in abolishing booms and thus keeping us permanently in a semi-slump, but in abolishing slumps and thus keeping us permanently in a quasi-boom. In a variety of books and articles, Hutt pointed out the absurdity of this. One cannot create wealth simply by printing more money or by borrowing and spending funds, which can never be repaid. Moreover, the real source of unemployment is some disturbance in the price and profit system. Government cannot possibly help matters by intervening in ways which further distort and disturb that system. In his Theory of Idle Resources, Hutt deconstructs even the initial premise of Keynes's thinking, that we should want a permanent condition of full employment. Not only is full employment not definable, it is not even desirable. A moment's thought will show this to be true. To grow, an economy must change. To change, assets and workers must be shifted from where they are less needed, less productive, to where they are more needed, more productive. These shifts will inevitably produce temporary unemployment. If there had never been unemployment and thus no economic change, we would all still be living in caves, and there would be far fewer of us because hunting and gathering would only support a small fraction of the present population. Hutt's careful reasoning demonstrates through a variety of illustration that we cannot just lump together and falsely quantify all the complexities of human choice and action working with a closely coordinated price and profit system. What looks like non-productive idleness may actually be very productive, indeed essential to the smooth working of the system. Is it more productive for a highly trained but unemployed engineer to buy groceries for pay or to invest time without pay in looking for an engineering job? If he or she took the grocery bagging job, Keynes would presumably be satisfied. We would be closer to full employment, but the economy would clearly not be more productive, which it must be to create new jobs. We should also keep in mind that an employment agency employee job searching for the engineer would be considered gainfully employed, while the engineer doing the same work would still be unemployed. So you see, the very idea that the quote-unquote goal of the economy should be full employment is a nonsense dreamt up by Keynes and followed by unthinking central planners of all kinds. In any case, to come back to inflation, it is absurd to define inflation as a rising when and only when an economy hits 100% employment and the government and private sector must compete for resources. This is an obvious nonsense. Inflation arises when there is an expansion in the money supply because it changes the exchange ratio of money to all other goods in the economy. Incidentally, as Ludwig von Mises famously pointed out in the theory of money and credit, the rise in prices across the economy does not happen all at once, but is rather staggered. 
the government or the banks create new money to be spent on specific goods and services. The demand for these goods thereby rises, raising these specific prices. Gradually, the new money ripples through the economy, raising demand and prices as it goes. Income and wealth are redistributed to those who receive the new money early in the process at the expense of those who receive the new money late in the day and of those on fixed incomes who receive no new money at all. Two types of shifts in relative prices occur as the result of this increase in money. Number one, the redistribution from late receivers to early receivers that occurs during the inflation process and number two, the permanent shifts in wealth and income that continue even after the effects of the increase in the money supply have worked themselves out. For the new equilibrium will reflect a change pattern of wealth, income and demand resulting from the changes during the intervening inflationary process. For example, the fixed income groups permanently lose in relative wealth and income. These are known as Cantillon effects. So, in fact, there is no unitary price level in the economy. Prices in the real economy are always staggered and highly specific in this manner. As I explained in a previous video, the price of a bottle of Coca-Cola remained fixed at 5 cents for 70 years. But quite plainly, its real price, which is to say its price as an exchange ratio relative to all other goods, fluctuated during that time. So, in fact, aggregate macroeconomic statistics like the purchasing power of money or to imagine a unitary rate of inflation across all goods are actually, if you look at the real economy, quite meaningless. You're dealing at best with extremely crude abstractions which are giving you a rough estimate of what's going on in the economy. But this will not do if you're looking to seriously trace causal effects. And even beyond all that, you often need to look at real prices rather than nominal prices to understand how the exchange ratio of a good relative to all other goods has changed. For example, in Atlanta, Georgia, in January 1971, the hourly pay of a McDonald's worker was $1.30. The price of a dozen eggs was 60 cents, and the price of a television set was $188.05. Today, the McDonald's worker in Atlanta would get $7.25 an hour, the price of a dozen eggs is $2.47, and the price of a TV set will set you back $600. You can see that although there has been inflation in nominal terms for both eggs and TV sets since 1971, in real terms, that is, as a percentage of the McDonald's workers' wages, both eggs and TV sets have in fact come down. A dozen eggs was 46% of an hour's wages in 1971, but now is only 34%. The McDonald's worker could not have paid for a TV set with an entire month's worth of wages in 1971, but today 59% of their wages could buy one. And that's not all. As you can see by the exchange ratio between eggs and TV sets, TV sets have become cheaper relative to eggs. In 1971, one TV set would have set you back 322 cartons of eggs, whereas today you'd need only 244 cartons. In other words, the real price of a TV set has fallen faster than the real price of a dozen eggs, even though this information is obscured by inflation. And this right here is real economics. And now, finally, we can get to what the modern monetary theorists actually say. All of their reasoning derives from looking at how the GDP statistic is calculated and then pay, playing around with equations to show that private savings are somehow the function of government spending. It all boils down to this equation right here. G minus T equals S minus I. Here, G means government spending, T means taxation, S means private savings, and I means private investment. Now, to understand what this means, let's go back a few steps. GDP is calculated in two ways, uh, and you can see the two formulas here. Here, C is total consumer spending, I is private investments, 
G is government spending, X is imports, M is exports, S is private savings, and T is taxation. Now, obviously, these two equations equal each other, like so, and we can eliminate C because they cancel each other out. And following the rules of algebra, you can make one side zero as follows. And we can take out from this the international trade element, that's the imports and the exports for obvious reasons, and that leaves us with G minus T equals S minus I. Or, as Robert P. Murphy has put it much more elegantly, government budget deficit equals net private savings. And this allows MMTers to say things like government spending creates a demand for saving. Now, the reason I was taking such pains earlier in talking about the prices of TV sets and eggs and so on at specific places in specific times was because here the MMTers are working at an extraordinary level of remove and abstraction from the real economy. All these figures in the GDP calculation are incredibly broad, rough, crude, aggregate numbers, which actually tell us very little about what is going on under the hood, as it were. Then, in a frankly quite ridiculous move, they imagine that playing around with aggregate data, st statistical constructs, in this manner, using algebra, has causal explanatory power in the real world. This actually has no explanatory power whatsoever. Think about the absurdity of what is being said here. That in order for you to forego consumption, that is to set aside some portion of your wages for a rainy day, you require the government to employ people to dig a ditch or to build a bridge? Now, of course, they are not saying exactly that. They are saying that in aggregate, if you add up all of the savings of all of the people, then you will get a bigger number if the government spends more on digging ditches and building bridges. It's difficult to see how this follows. For a start, let's say the government did this purely through ditch digging and bridge building programs. This would, of course, affect the price of shovels, diggers, JCBs, bricks, hard hats, and so on and so forth. Then, when the ditch diggers and the bridge builders get paid, remember, they are the first receivers of this cash, they get to buy all their consumer goods first, and then the money ripples through the economy, and the inflationary effect takes root and prices rise. Granny, who has been saving her money under the bed, uh, has seen her savings reduced. The ditch diggers and the bridge builders got to enjoy cheaper items at the expense of Granny's saving. She has been made worse off for their benefit. In effect, it's a redistribution scheme from Granny to the ditch diggers and the bridge builders, as all inflationary schemes like this are. Far from increasing aggregate savings, this policy will hurt savers in general, especially as it sees an increase in the M1 money supply, which affects real prices in the real economy, unlike government bonds sitting on the asset balance sheets of Goldman Sachs. Modern monetary theory is not some new economics. It's just a lot of old bad ideas which have been exposed in both theory and practice countless times before repackaged and rebranded and sold to gullible journalists and idiotic politicians who have an interest in bribing voters with shiny goodies. And if there's anything as certain as deaths and taxes in this world, it is that journalists, politicians and voters in general will continue to be moronic no matter how many times these bad old ideas are proven to fail. Now get out.